As a sales rep prospecting or reaching out to a customer, we've been taught some things that may not necessarily be the most productive or effective way of selling. We could fix that. Particularly my friend Andy Paul today is going to come on a podcast and talk to us about how we can sell without selling out and how we can abandon some of those old school, not so effective, sleazy method and to make sure we're prospecting and connecting with buyers on a more effective way. Check it out. Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome to another great episode of the Sales Evangelist Podcast. My name is Donald C. Kelly, the Sales Evangelist, and I'm so excited for another great episode. I'm so excited to be here with you today. And on this episode, we have the one and only, the great Mr. Andy Paul with over 40 years of selling experience, a best-selling author, I've written several books. Andy has an, a phenomenal podcast. We have link back, uh, links back in the show notes so you can go ahead and check it out and learn about Andy. But Andy not only has been a practitioner, but he's also an educator. And when I asked him about this at the very beginning of the episode, you'll hear it. He said that he's a teacher. And you're going to see why he classifies himself as this individual. Because with so much knowledge, he's able to teach sales reps on how to be the human. How they can sell and to be more effective in their sales approach. His latest book, Sell Without Selling Out, is available everywhere you find books. If you are watching this early, you can see the pre-order. If not, you can watch it or listen to it a little bit later. You can check that out as well. But I have a link in our show notes. If this is your first time listening to one of our podcasts, please subscribe as well as go ahead and share this with a friend. We'd love to get a rating and review from you as well on Apple Podcasts and tell us how you're loving the show. Um, without further ado, when I, you, you're going to hear Andy. And, and again, as I mentioned from the very beginning, when I start talking to him, it's like he jumps into this and starts going on the gas, start teaching job is to persuade you to buy my product, then it doesn't really matter whether I understand. My job is to persuade you to buy it. Yeah. Right? My job is to overcome objections, right? That's one of the most salesy things we can say. Overcome an objection. It's like, well, first of all, people aren't really objecting to anything, right? I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's not like a courtroom drama. Your Honor, I object. <laughs> it's right. <laughs> I don't, I don't Can care I that much. Andy? No. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, your buyers don't care that much. They're not objecting. 
what we call objections are just questions, right? I don't understand. So I'm asking a question. I don't understand. It's, you know, it's so, you know, we've built up all this, this vocabulary around what people are trying to do and it's influences how they act. Words matter. Yeah. And so if you say this is an objection, then suddenly I need to persuade you that it's not important to you. So what I talk about in the book is, is instead of persuasion, you want to think about it from an influence standpoint. Because persuasion, just in the definition of persuasion, it, it talks about you know, prevailing on someone to come to your point of view. It's, it's, it's a basically a coercive action that you take. Whereas influence is about having an effect on the actions and thoughts of other people without the use of force, right? And so it's just a different mindset and perspective to have is yes my job is not to persuade you by my product my job is to listen to what's really understand truly understand what's most important to you and then help influence the choices and decisions you make about how to achieve that Hmm. that's our job what's the way to develop this connection what's sort of the core of this connection you need to build well it's credibility it's trust um, I write about in the book, you know, there's a question sort of at the heart of a connection, which is the question I call the why you question. Yeah. And you know, every time you're, you're to a potential buyer, really the first hurdle you have to get over is answering this question. Why you? Why should they invest their time in you? Why should they trust you? Why should, you know, they, they uh, well, we'll start with those two. It's just, but it's, it's there. It's not a question to ask out loud. But they're asking it nonetheless. Hmm. And the reason it becomes so important, and this boils back down to the connection, is that the trust that's most important to the buyers is the trust with you as an individual. More so than the company you work for, it's you as a seller. You're this first line of differentiation. You're this first line of connection between the buyer and your product or service. And Gartner did a study uh, sometime in the last 10 years, I forget the exact date, but showing that this idea of when you ask buyers about their buying experience and the trust, it started with the individual more so than the company. Yeah. Right? So it doesn't happen if you don't have a connection with somebody else. If you haven't really developed it and understood, you know, take the steps to understand what's really important to them and to develop a level of credibility and trustworthiness. And so what happens is we train people to just be superficial with curiosity. And the fact is that, again, as humans, the way we navigate our way through an uncertain world or an unfamiliar world is through our curiosity, through the questions we ask. And so clamping off the curiosity, if you will, of sellers by saying, here are the things you ask. This is our playbook. This is how we go about it. And then you never get to a level of real understanding of the buyer. And I can't begin to tell you the number of times where I knew that my ability to win very large deals came down to the fact that I and my team that I worked with, we had a better understanding of the buyer than the competitors. And thus, we were able to put forth a solution that was more in line with what they needed to get the thing that was most important to them. And so if you give up too soon, then... That's problematic. And and we have this, we reinforce this in B2B sales these days, because if you look at a, a diagram of a sales process, it has all these stages, and this one confined stage is just called discovery, as if you just do it once. Actually, you discover every time you interact with the buyer, you should be in discovery mode, right? Because as you're talking to a buyer, they could be talking to two or three other vendors, and they're learning right? They're gathering new information. If you think your buyers are static, right? If you think, oh, I did discovery. I know, I, I know these things about them. And if you think they're staying in place, you're wrong. You're going to lose the deal because they're educating themselves and they're being educated by, by your competitors. So you have this, this imperative to keep discovery going, to keep asking questions, to keep amplifying your curiosity throughout the sales process. So understanding. As I said, our job as sellers is to listen, to understand, 
what's the most important thing to the buyer and then help them get that. So this level of understanding is critical. It's like I mentioned before, we can gather lots of information as most sellers do during discovery, but then they don't understand why it's important to the buyer. What's the context? And a lot of times it's just because, again, they stop too soon, right? They're satisfied to gather uh, a certain level of information where they need to go deeper. And there's a quote in the book, which I love from Clayton, the late Clayton Christensen, who had written The Innovator's Dilemma. And uh, he said, you know, questions are the places in our mind where answers go. Right? We have to get love the it. questions out to make room for the answers. And so understanding okay. is, is, you know, parts taking it taking it deeper, make sure we really understand. And yeah, walk readers through in the book, uh, some examples of how to do this with great follow-up questions, uh, very simple follow-up questions that everybody can ask questions like, mm -hmm. that's interesting. And what else can you tell me about that? And this is a, a question you can find in Michael Bungay Stanier's book, The Coaching Habit. He yeah. talks about this is, is, and what else can you tell me about that? And you, what you're doing is you're opening the door for the buyer to, to share more with you, right? I'm, I'm yeah. interested. You're saying, I'm interested. I want to hear more. And you can layer your follow-up questions together. You can put a few together. You can ask that a couple times in a row. Interesting. Well, tell me more about that. And then just when you think you got it, and many sellers are trained at this point, we'll use, you know, reflect back to the buyer, what you think you heard, get their confirmation. You certainly want to do that. But then comes the real key to understanding and say, okay, I just reflected back to you, Donald, what I heard you tell me. Then you ask the real great question, which is, so what are we missing? Ooh, yeah. All right? We've gone through it. I've dug as deep as I can. You've confirmed I'm right on track. But what am I missing? What are we missing here? Yeah. And then you just open it up again. So you have to feel very comfortable that, and the buyers will let you go down this path, right? If you're, if you're uncovering, because our job as sellers is not just to understand what they tell us. Our job as sellers is to help the buyer understand what their problem is, is to a better degree, right? Yeah. And to understand what the potential outcomes they can achieve are. And yeah, you know, sort of built in some of the challenger sale, right? Is is the challenge is to push back to help people think more broadly and deeply about the problems. This is what you're trying to do with understanding, is you're trying to help the not only just you understand, but trying the process help the buyer understand. And so when you get to that point, you know, one of the rules, I believe, one of the greatest sources of value we can bring to a buyer as a seller is to make them feel understood. I have an acronym in the book I call MICE, M-I-C-E, sort of four, <laughs> four cornerstones of trust. Yeah. And M is for motivations. Are your motivations for working with the buyer transparent? Right? Is... It's okay. I mean, Adam Grant talks about this in Give and Take. It's okay mm -hmm. to be a giver, as he talks about, with an agenda, right? Yeah. I will only succeed to the extent that I help you succeed. I mean, your seller, your buyers aren't under any illusion that you're there to sell to them. Yeah. But they have to feel like they come first. And the most common way that, that sales sellers and sales managers in particular trash that, that trust is say, Seller shows up, developing a good relationship with with the buyer. I'm here to help, and then you get to the last three days of the month, and the manager needs an order to hit his number, and it's like, uh, Donald, go out and close that deal. What, bro? What are you talking about, man? Sound familiar? Yep. <laughs> yep. Go close that deal. Give him a big discount. Let's make this happen. I need to hit my number. Oh, Andy, you followed me around my career too long. <laughs> and then, well, but we all were forced to do stuff like that early yeah. in our career. I mean, I allude to this in the book is, yeah, I had a big client. Again, this was relatively early in my career, but I was starting to sell some really big deals. And this guy's a big client, and he was going to give us an add-on order. <laughs> and it's going to come by the end of the year. I had made my number for the year. My boss hadn't. And uh, Jack was going to give me an order before Christmas break, and his company was closed between Christmas and New Year's. And, you know, it was just going to get pushed to January. My boss, yeah, didn't have that. Uh, wouldn't have that. So 
forced me to call this customer at his home on Christmas Eve while his family was opening presents to say, can you fax me an order? Most mortifying thing I'd had to do oh in goodness. sales. And the last time ever, I ever gave into that pressure to do it. But we completely trashed the relationship. Yeah. You know, this was a you know, million dollar plus a year relationship that they couldn't wait. Yeah. This change away from us. You know, within two years, even though we there were huge, huge presence in their account. Doesn't that, matter. That that killed the relationship. Yeah. For what? And unfortunately what? it it affects your relationship with that client. And, oh, and yeah. still yet the company is, is you know, has the black eye, but Andy also is the person that did that. So definitely has a, a right. that, so, that, that stain. Yeah, so yeah, I'd come out with the right motivations, but all I saw were the motivations of the company at that point. And so yeah. motivations being transparent, the eye in mice is integrity. So if you, again, the lines the first one, if you say you're there to help, do your actions align with your words? That's the integrity. Yeah. Do you have competence to do and the credibility to do what you say you can do? And can you execute on your promises? Yeah. And so as a seller, you want to look at this building trust is saying, well, how do I give myself and build into my selling process opportunities to demonstrate competence and opportunities to demonstrate that we can live up to our commitments in the process of going through the buyer journey. Isn't that great? Andy Paul, the great educator. I told you this dude was going to bring some value today. If you have not checked them, checked out his website or his podcast or anything that Andy has, please go on the show notes, click on a manifesto and go ahead and sign that as well as check out his book. Tell him that you heard him on the Sales Evangelist. You can find him on LinkedIn as well. Just search Andy Paul. He's a great individual, phenomenal, super brilliant as you heard in the discussion today. And I love listening to him because he brings so much, like a wealth of knowledge whenever he shares information. As always, I share this. I bring folks like Andy on this podcast because I want you you to succeed and thrive. I want you to find more of those ideal customers. I want you to sell without selling out. I want you to build value in an effective way. I want you to be able to come with that curiosity. I want you to naturally close more deals, but most importantly, I want you to raise your level of thinking, become the seller we know you are capable of being and what you want to be, who you want to be. And I want you to go out and do big things. Thanks so much for watching.